on World News Tonight. Myriad disasters. China, Australia and Italy witness excruciating weather conditions, with Italy declaring a state of emergency. Economic turbulence. With the crisis in Ukraine continuing and a global recession in its potential early stages, multiple countries are witnessing skyrocketing commodity prices and scarcity. Cancer-free. Hopeful strides made in finding a cure for cancer. Tonight we bring you the latest from a company that produced the COVID-19 vaccine. And celebrating in style. The United States celebrates its Independence Day with no compromise on the festivities. Good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. A lot to report to you and we are going to start off with a few stories on the weather conditions around the world. Now, we begin tonight's coverage from the situation in China in the wake of Typhoon Chaba. Buildings in China's Yongzhou city were inundated with floodwaters. Over the weekend, China's first typhoon of the year brought heavy rain and wind to several southern provinces already waterlogged from several weeks of torrential rains and thunderstorms. Heavy rain is expected to hit central and southern China over the next few days as the expansive rain belts of a weakening typhoon sweep inland from the country's southern coastline. China is historically prone to floods, triggering landslides and swamping many acres of farmland. But increasingly intense rainfall and flooding are set to test its emergency response systems in the coming years. Over to Australia, this is an update from yesterday. Fresh evacuation orders were issued for thousands of Sydney residents after relentless rains flooded several suburbs in Australia's largest city, with officials warning of more wild weather over the next 12 hours. Emergency response teams made 100 rescues overnight of people trapped in cars on flooded roads or in inundated homes in the Sydney area. Torrential rains battered Australia's east coast on Tuesday, making a flood crisis in Sydney worse. Around 50,000 people across New South Wales, most in Sydney's west, were ordered to leave their homes after rivers swiftly rose past danger levels. New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet warned people to stay alert. Wherever you are, please be careful uh, when you're driving on our roads. Obviously there is still substantial risk uh, for flash flooding across our state. The federal government declared the floods a natural disaster helping flood-hit residents receive emergency funding support. And the risk of flooding could remain through the week. <laughs> Among the most vulnerable in need of rescue are animals. On Tuesday, horses and cows swam with water up to their necks in search of higher ground in Sydney's outskirts. Farmer Wayne Zulrev said the water came up quickly, forcing farmers to act fast. Obviously we've got to get them out now, so it's happened. It's happened overnight and, um, yeah. To get him out. The state emergency service joined in to help. Yeah, it was really difficult with uh, multiple uh, animals in the uh, water. Emergency services boarded rafts, lassoing the animals and pulling them through flood water to safety. Several places received more than Australia's annual average rainfall in three days. Over to Europe now, Italy declared a state of emergency for areas surrounding the river Po which accounts for roughly a third of the country's agricultural production and is suffering its worst drought for 70 years. A government decree has been put in to allow authorities to cut through red tape and take action immediately if they think it necessary, such as to impose water rationing for homes and businesses. The River Po, which is Italy's longest river, runs for more than 650 kilometres to the wealthy north of Italy. However, many stretches of the waterway have run dry and farmers say the flow is so weak that seawater is seeping inland, destroying crops. Verona and Pisa, home to nearly 350,000 people, have moved to ration drinking water in the face of a historic drought in the region. The government has said in a statement that the emergency measures would cover lands that bordered the River Po and the water basins of the Eastern Alps. Prime Minister Mario Draghi was also considering appointing a commissioner to coordinate the drought response. Over to the United States now, U.S. police have arrested a suspect after six people were killed in a mass shooting at Independence Day Parade in Highland Park, Illinois. It is the latest mass shooting to hit the United States. There has been one in every week of 2022. President Joe Biden said that he was shocked by the violence. 
Late today, after a nearly 10-hour manhunt, police said they found the car they believed was driven by someone they're calling a person of interest, a man police consider the shooting suspect. Subject did flee. Uh, a brief pursuit uh, was uh, had went on. Uh, ultimately, they were able to get the subject stopped uh, at Wesley and 41 in Lake Forest. Uh, the subject was taken into custody without incident. They've identified him as 22-year-old Robert C. Cremo, known as Bobby. Police say he's also known as the rapper Awake. Police from Chicago and other communities rushed in to help. Along with federal agents, they joined hundreds of officers in an intensive search, launching aircraft and drones, deploying dog teams, and pleading for public tips. Officers fanned out from the scene of the parade, searching nearby buildings. Residents in the area were urged to stay in their homes. 2022 has brought a flood of high-profile mass shootings, more than 300 incidents in all so far this year. That's approaching a record number. Mass shootings in the U.S. have been on the rise since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Public gatherings are especially difficult to secure, and the Department of Homeland Security has warned that the U.S. remains in a heightened threat environment with a mix of motives. Last November, a man plowed his SUV into a crowd gathered for the annual Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin, just outside Milwaukee. Six people were killed and more than 60 were hurt. Police said the driver, angry and speeding away from a domestic dispute, targeted the crowd. Now the investigation begins into what the motive possibly could have been. Or more economic stories, fearing Russia might cut off natural gas supplies, the head of Germany's regulatory agency for energy called on residents to save energy and to prepare for winter when use increases. Federal Network Agency President Klaus Müller urged house and apartment owners to have their gas boilers and radiators checked and adjusted to maximize their efficiency. Germany is preparing rescue measures for utilities hit by the gas supply crisis. They say the government wants to enshrine the measures in its energy security law. Right now, attention focuses on gas supplier Uniper. It's one of the biggest customers for Gazprom. But Uniper says it's only getting about 40% of its usual supply from Russia. The sources say Germany would only take a stake in the firm as a last resort. Instead, measures may be based on the relief that Lufthansa got at the height of the global health crisis. The airline was saved from bankruptcy with an aid package totaling over $9 billion. Though the state did take a stake, it didn't get any voting rights. Government sources say ministers would rather rescue Uniper than let them drastically increase prices for consumers. They reportedly are not about to trigger legal mechanisms that would allow utilities to pass on their increased costs. The sources say ministers also think Uniper will be the only utility to need a rescue, making a bailout look manageable. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now, many people in South Korea are struggling to stay afloat as inflation soars with no apparent end to skyrocketing prices in sight. Making matters worse, electricity bills will increase later this month, keeping even more of a burden on businesses and households alike. The economic hardship brought by inflation is hitting people from all walks of life. This restaurant owner has been running his business for 25 years, but the price of ingredients is becoming harder to handle. His regulars have helped him push through the past couple of years of hardship, but now prices have risen more than 30 percent from last year. The price of cooking oil, for instance, has tripled. I've never seen this kind of inflation in my 25 years of business. And the increased cost of ingredients is starting to be reflected in the prices that customers have to pay, too. I've seen a lot of places where stickers with new prices have been put on the menu. A quick run to the grocery store costs more than 50,000 won. Hit more directly by the soaring gas prices are taxi drivers. Even LPG, which had been relatively inexpensive, has exceeded 1,100 won. That's roughly 85 cents. Yet taxi fares haven't changed. One third of a day's income goes out in fuel costs. The cost of living is going up and income is decreasing. Times are difficult. 
Small and medium-sized companies that support the South Korean economy are all affected by high inflation, high interest rates, and high exchange rates. High global energy costs have brought on the latest hike in electricity rates here in South Korea that will go into effect for electricity bills this month. The people are feeling more pain as there seems to be no end in sight for the rising prices. Over to the conflict in Ukraine, Russian forces have captured the last Ukrainian holdout in the Luhansk region and are moving to seize the Donetsk region. President Zelensky vowed to retake the city with improved new weaponry. The last city has been taken. Lysychansk, the final Ukrainian holdout in the Luhansk region, has been taken away from Ukraine's control. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu on Sunday local time reported to President Vladimir Putin that Russia's troops along with local separatist militia have established full control over the city. Ukraine's general staff of the armed forces said via social media that Ukrainian military were forced to withdraw in order to preserve the lives of defenders. To this, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the country's withdrawal was to protect the lives of its soldiers and people while vowing to retake the city using new, improved weaponry. If the commanders of our army recall people from certain points where the enemy has the greatest fire advantage, in particular this also applies to Lysenchek, it means only one thing, that we will return thanks to our tactics, thanks to the increase in the supply of modern weapons. After seizing Luhansk, Russian forces have switched their focus to capturing the Donetsk region. The city of Slovyansk has been experiencing its heaviest shelling in recent days, along with the nearby city of Kramatorsk, which was hit with three missile strikes on Sunday morning. According to the head of the Public Information and Communication Department of the Donetsk region, at least six people have been killed and 15 injured. Though Russia is in control of the Luhansk region, the fall of Lysychansk is by no means the end of the fighting in Donbas. Ukraine still controls large urban areas in neighboring Donetsk, the country is setting new defensive lines. Meanwhile, amid the ongoing war, the U.S. said that it is not Washington's role to push Ukraine to negotiate a settlement with Russia, even if the Biden administration thinks that it is the right thing to do. The words of John Kirby of the United States National Security Council, who confirmed that the U.S. will support Ukraine, adding that it is Zelensky's decision. A Sudan's leading general said the country's military will withdraw from negotiations and to solve the ongoing political crisis after a coup last year, allowing civil society representatives to take their place. Since the coup, the United Nations political mission in Sudan, the African Union, an eight-nation East African Regional Intergovernmental Authority on Development have been trying to broker her way out of the political impasse. Sudan's military leader says the army will be stepping back from political talks, paving the way for political and revolutionary groups to form a transitional government. General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan made the announcement in a televised speech on Monday. Dialogue, he said, would bring everyone back to the path of democratic transition. This comes after months of demonstrations in Sudan against his military leadership. At least eight people died in a protest last week. The military seized power last October, replacing a transitional government that was formed after the toppling of President Omar al-Bashir in 2019. More than 100 protesters have died since then, and the UN's human rights commissioner says some 335 have been arrested. In his speech, Burhan did not clarify the scope of the military's role in politics going forward, but he said it will be committed to implementing the outcomes of talks, which are backed by the UN and the African Union. We have some good news for you. A personalized cancer vaccine made from individual patients own DNA has produced really hopeful early results. Preliminary data from a clinical trial being run at the Clatter Bridge Cancer Center show that none of the first eight patients given the jab have relapsed, even after several months. It's almost exactly a year ago that Brian Wright had his lower jaw replaced with bone taken from his leg, surgery needed because he had a tumor in his mouth. <laughs> he's recovered well, but head and neck cancer has a high chance of returning, so he's part of a trial to test a vaccine made from his own tumour. 
a personal jab that should put his immune system on watch for the first sign of a relapse. He wasn't sure at first. To make the vaccine, cancer cells are first removed from an individual patient. DNA mutations unique to the tumour are identified and then cut and pasted into a harmless virus. When the virus is injected into the body, it trains the immune system to target cancer cells, hopefully destroying them before they even form a lump. Early results show all eight patients to receive the vaccine so far have remained well after several months, but two of another eight who weren't given the jab have relapsed. Scientists in Oxford developed the AstraZeneca jab and are now working on a vaccine to treat prostate cancer. They're applying what they learned with COVID. The pandemic has helped and accelerated the development of a whole range of new vaccines. We learned about their safety in billions of people, whereas previously it had been in thousands. That's very helpful safety data to have. And it means that there will be a lot more investment now in fields like cancer, where we desperately need better therapies. Brian has a dose of his vaccine every three weeks, but he feels so good that right now he's off for a pint. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Pope Francis has rebuffed suggestions, saying he may be readying to resign, saying that rumours he was suffering from a serious illness were court gossip. He denied rumours that he had been diagnosed with stomach cancer during his colon operation in July of 2021. Pope Francis will travel to Canada this month, after which he said he would like to travel to Moscow and Kiev if possible. Ryanair had its busiest month ever in June as it flew 15.9 million passengers, up from 5.3 million a year earlier, and topping a previous high set in May. Its load factor, which measures how well the airline is filling available seats, reached 95% for the first time since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Irish airline, Europe's largest by passenger numbers, said it operated over 88,500 flights in June, as its load factor rose from 92% a month earlier but it flew 15.4 million passengers. Rescue operations were underway in the Italian Alps after parts of the mountain glacier collapsed, killing at least six people and injuring eight. Thunderstorms have hampered the search for more than a dozen hikers who remain unaccounted for a day after a huge chunk of an alpine glacier in Italy broke off, sending an avalanche of ice, snow and rocks down the slope. West Africa's main political and economic bloc has agreed to lift sanctions on Mali and Burkina Faso after both proposed a 24-month transition back to constitutional order. The bloc imposed stiff sanctions on Mali in January after the military government said it would not organize democratic elections the following month as initially planned. Top European hotel chains are hiring workers without experience or even a resume as the industry struggles to meet a surge in the global travel demand. Thousands of workers left the hospitality industry when international travel shut down during the COVID-19 pandemic. Many chose not to return, finding better paid employment elsewhere. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news from around the globe. If you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with a brilliant display of fireworks in New York, celebrating the United States independence. Though the Independence Day celebrations this time around took a chaotic turn, there were signs of beauty in the skies. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.